Today on the show, I'm happy to have David Maraska. He's the founder of Nine High. They perform human AI collaborative decision guidance through their platform. Now, before this company, you were running the largest privately owned test lab in the US for the DOD, Department of Defense. And what did you learn about how to deal with failures and come out the other side? My background is I've had developed an awful lot of different products and technologies in multiple industries. So I actually started off in aerospace and defense first, and it was talking about failure and then moving to success. It seemed like I would go work for a company and I'd learn, and I was an engineer developing technology, developing products for them. And it was interesting because it was in the eighties and the nineties. And at the time was just when all the large companies were starting to outsource outside the, outside the country. So I would join a company, make their product better, give them some new stuff. And all of a sudden they say, I know they're shipping their production to, to the far East or to Mexico or even to Europe sometimes. And, and then it'd be like, okay, time to move on. And is that a failure? Is that success? It's both together. But the nice thing is that I, you know, I had to move from aerospace to electronics, to raw materials, to automotive and in different roles, I actually was able to learn a lot by how different industries develop technologies. And I got to pick up a lot of best practices, even though I did some pharmaceutical work and I got to understand how the FDA does things, FDA does things and how chemistry and sciences come together for that. So now, so fast forwarding then, it was really after 9-11, talk about failure again and then success again. So I was living in Manhattan in New York City, working for a $3 billion Japanese company running a business unit. And all of a sudden these planes come crashing into the building. And unfortunately, a lot of people died. I actually went in and dug for a few days in, in, in the pile, in the pit, they called it at the time. And uh, I got very patriotic after that. While the Japanese company was wonderful, really smart people and it was great. I wanted to do something to help our country out. So I heard about this company, Dayton T. Brown, out here in Long Island, New York, and they needed a new senior vice president, general manager to run the facility. And I had worked in so many different markets and industries that I felt pretty well qualified to go into a test lab and help because I had, was the guy who was developing and testing stuff before. I thought I'd know an awful lot about it to be able to go and run at the senior level, a company like that. So that's exactly what I did. I went in, interviewed and got hired. And it ended up being, like you said, it's the largest privately owned test lab in the country for the DOD. So now we're just getting into where there's heightened military activity going on in the world. There's IEDs blowing people up in Iraq and people's body parts, unfortunately, blowing all over the place and you come back with the amputees and a lot of bad things were happening. And they needed a lot of technologies very quickly to make it out to the warfighter in order to armor a Humvee, to improve ballistic glass, right? Body armor, helmets, all sorts of things, just better, better weapon systems. And that's what this laboratory is for. It was, it was like an underwriter laboratory for the DOD. Um, yeah, we could replicate any environment under sea, on land, in air or outer space. So any new thing that like Lockheed Martin or General Dynamics or Boeing or even smaller companies that would have new, you know, the government would make sure that we were in the cycle and, and they'd have prototypes and things brought to us and we would validate them. We'd put them in a development cycle and make sure that they were qualified to do what they were supposed to do. And talk about failure again. So we're going to start, you can't get into this conversation without talking what they literally call the valley of death. There's so much failure going on. This is not valley of death of people. It's the valley of death for technologies. So it's amazing that the published numbers that come out from the DOD, and this is also true for commercial markets, is that 80 to 90% of all technologies that people invest into or try to develop fail. They go nowhere. So you hear about like venture capital folks that they might invest in 40 different projects just to get, try and get one or two that give them their return and they make their money on. And that's not untrue. And that's, to me, it's terrible. Why are we that bad at that? Why do we fail? So and I fail too. And that was painful. I like to be, everybody wants to be successful, right? You're, you want to be successful with these podcasts. You want people to enjoy them, get something out of it. And when you're developing a technology and you're gambling with millions of dollars along the way, and it turns into gambling and it's not right. You should have a process that's more consistent and helps provide more guidance to people. Because I wasn't, I probably had a 20% success rate and I was probably double of what most of the U.S. industry had at the time. So I thought I was doing good things, but now I get into this laboratory where if they were in decline a little bit when I joined them, I helped them grow their company significantly with really offering new services to be able to do more and greater things as technology advanced and everything. So love the opportunity that I had there. I thank Mr. Brown to this day for giving me that position there. 
And what I found now I had access to thousands of projects a year and they're in our, they're our responsibility not to be successful, but to evaluate them properly. And I've had, I felt so much pain for other people. Uh, it was painful for me personally to fail, to see things not work out with my important projects. I worked for Philips Electronics. I worked for Ube Industries, I worked for Fan Aerospace. So I had, I always had important things that I was working on and that were risky, but the failure was just terrible. And now to run this laboratory, right? Where if we don't, we have to be honest, we have to make sure things actually work properly because otherwise you're sending product out to a warfighter and their life might depend on it literally for survival equipment, for functioning of, of anything they have in those environments. If, if their year is not working, they're in trouble very quickly. So we had to make sure we were put it through its paces properly and very ethically along the way. But uh, yeah, and we saw at least 80 to 90% failure rate. So what do you do with that? And how do you make that better? And uh, that gets into the logo I got here, Nine High. I actually, before that, I started working for a Japanese company before, again, the one I mentioned that was in New York City. And uh, I started developing this sort of process. And that's all it was at the time was it was a guidance process to say, okay, you had a $3 billion company I was working for. I was running a business unit for North and South America for them. And I was solely responsible for deciding what, what technologies we needed to develop back in Japan for the markets that we had in North and South America. And that's a lot that's complicated. There's a, it was raw materials. So you had plastic, plastic polymer materials and uh, different chemicals and things that can go to a wide variety of applications. So it, it was really complicated. And I started building this process where I looked at the technology. I looked at what I called the team and stakeholders, which are the people who are going to be developing it, marketing it, bringing it forward, and then looking at the market applications. And I started to build this matrix of, to be able to take that technology and march it through until you get to the marketplace. And that ended up being nine high. It turned into something, especially after I left Dayton T. Brown, I spent a lot of time to start to integrate artificial intelligence into it. And that's a whole nother part of this conversation we can get into because I started to, I started working directly with some folks in the secretary of defense's office. And uh, I shared with them this process that I had started working on was back in the Japanese in 1999. And now it's fast forward to 2017, 2019 or so. And I'm working with these guys directly in secretary of defense itself because I get good access now. You know, I've got people at top who are influential within the DOD and can make things happen. And uh, they were having some troubles with some very complicated technologies. I started making some recommendations to them and they turned out to be pretty good. And, uh, and I, at that point I had gained a lot of confidence in Nyan High because a lot of the things, a lot of the things I helped people to diagnose within the laboratory were very good. And I just looked like I was a very intelligent person at the time. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, I got spreadsheets and I got numbers that I'm running and I got a process really behind the scenes of helping me to make recommendations to people in the first place. And uh, so, it, yeah, at the time I just looked like I was like a very smart person, which I, well, I'm not a dummy. It's better when you have a process that guides you along the way and a quantitative process and something that's, that you can run some numbers with. And so I introduced it to the guys, the secretary of defense. I took a risk with that because whatever, but I took a risk with some guys that were very stand up guys and really supported me. And uh, next thing I know off running my own business now and which I always wanted to do. And uh, I got funding from the U S air force for 1.5 million sponsored by the secretary of defense's office directly. And then I got, a, and then we showed our proof of concept there and we got halfway through what we're supposed to do. Like it's supposed to be an 18 month pro process, you about nine months in and they said, we get it. We see it. We see your proof of concept. You've got the system. And we hadn't even really started building the artificial intelligence into this yet. And next thing we've got a very good software platform that we just launched two weeks ago. So now this is what August 4th. And uh, two weeks ago, we just finally launched this and great support from Microsoft. They jumped in immediately. I've been working with three different CTOs at Microsoft. I knew Gupta, shout out to him. He's got us into a fast track program with them, the Founders Hub within them, gave us at least a couple hundred thousand of just credits so we can experiment with our AI agents along the way. And, uh, you know, that's gone really well. So we're at a point now where we can have this platform with five different AI agents with they're learning from the information that people use on the platform. And we also have GPT is like really big right now, right? So we actually have a GPT 3.5 feed into three of our five agents also. We, you can look at any, what's nice is you can look at any technology now. And this is where failure really turns into success along the way. That if it wasn't for the failures along the way, 
to show where the pain points are and where the problems really are. We could have never, ever built this thing out. And, and, and it takes a little bit of guts to take some people who aren't afraid to fail and take a little bit of risk and chance. And in the government, sometimes that's hard to find. They're always concerned about their careers. And if they do something wrong, they're concerned that things might not go their way for them for the next promotion. But you find some people that are real quality people that are a little bit technical and understand some things and they're willing to take a risk on you. And I'm glad they did because now we've got this amazing platform that'll provide decision guidance for developing any technology for any application. We're gonna be able to excel. We got a scout in there from the DOD. He's got, he set up 14 projects immediately. Some of these things are for like advanced propulsion systems for like space travel. And we're going to help them with that. We got, I've got a, a cardiologist over in Europe that's, that just came in and started using it. And we're talking about one platform that's going to be guiding people and helping people with space travel at the same time that we're going to be making advances in, in cardiac medicine with the same platform. And this is a plug for AI. I don't know if, they, I don't know if I've given you what you're looking for so far in this, in this discussion. But uh, there's a lot of discussion we can have around AI also, because a lot of people are concerned about if you fail with AI, what AI could do to you and how we've put safeguards in, we think against that along the way. But uh, yeah, so that's where we are right now, as far as launching this platform that's uh, based on failure in the first place and based on getting rid of failure and driving away out that value death. But now we're, we have a tool set that we can accelerate development. We can drive human intelligence higher by capturing the mistakes and the good decisions that people make in context. And nobody's ever done that before. Nobody's ever captured those kinds of decisions in context to feed it forward. So the next people coming along benefit from that. So I'm just incredibly excited at this point to have this out there and start inviting people in to start using it. So your platform actually advises, let's say CEOs, founders, and inventors on how to yield better results and save some time along the way? Yeah, so a lot of people can use it for a lot of reasons. And that's a really good point. You could just have an engineering team that's trying to understand the technology better and solve some smaller problem along the way. But an investor, venture capital folks, right? Not so much people on the stock market because that's not really what we're doing there. But if you're talking about, there's a lot of new ventures that are out there. There's a lot of big money that's being thrown around. And like I said before, you know, the, and they'll tell you, if they're being honest with you, the numbers I've heard are, it takes about 40 and it's a magic number out there. You're going to invest in 40 things before you get one or two that pay back on that. And uh, that's a terrible number. You know, would you want to do that with your investments? I wouldn't want to do it with mine, but that's, those are the risks these guys take. And I worked with a bunch of venture folks and sometimes they don't even consider the right things. Lots of them just look to see what other people invested in and they go invest in the same thing. I'd like to have a little more quantitative assessment behind all that. But yeah, a CEO, a CEO who's running a company and he's making a big bet. He's got a $10 million, $20 million, $50 million investment that could go, if it goes well, the company takes off. If it doesn't, the company could tank or be severely crippled and maybe hurt for years, maybe have to get bought out. Those are the kinds of decisions that you want to have some artificial intelligence help you with. You want the best human collaboration you can have. You want subject matter experts. And the thing is, we give you the framework. It doesn't matter what the technology or what the company is or the state of the company. It could be something that hasn't even been built yet or the application you're going to. We have a quantitative way of looking, of identifying all those risks. And with the right subject, and this is not just AI giving you all the best recommendations. It's a human team. Again, we're human in the loop. It's HI and nine high. The HI stands for human intelligence. We have five AI agents that can give really good recommendations, but they give them to people and then people put them into context and make sure that they're correct along the way. And uh, yeah, so CEOs, COOs, investment companies, financial institutions that are trying to find the next big thing coming and then right down to project managers and engineers and business people, salespeople, and marketing people are, their knowledge is so important because they understand the marketplace. And if you're not listening to your salespeople and your business development people, just as much as the engineers or the HR people or the accountants, they all need to work as a team in order to be successful in a business. And we give them a format where they can be successful. And those big risk things they're going to take, those big efforts for developing a new technology or, or acquiring a company, you're going to go and acquire a company. You want to understand those risks pretty well. And I know how to help you with that. So you took this system that you had developed the stress test ideas 
And now you've built agents who can come in and even do more advanced assessments. Yeah. Yeah. And there'll be more to come too. So this is the, this is what we've been able to build in the last 18 months is what, if somebody lives in right now today and creates a profile, you'll have five AI agents that are helping you. You'll be able to run your own groups, projects, and topics. You can invite your friends in. You can collaborate, do some brainstorming on something before you make a commitment to make an investment or anything like that. You can do all those things. And we don't charge, we only charge $599 per person per year. And it's unlimited usage. So you got some creative people who want to, look, you want to create the next electric plane or car, or you think you have a better, if you're a chemist, you might have a better battery combination. And you just want to pull some buddies together and talk about it and collaborate on it. That's how innovation happens. The larger companies don't innovate so much. You have some like Elon Musk's companies, right? They're just built on innovation. It's a whole different way that they operate. But most innovation within the whole ecosystem within the U.S. economy comes from small businesses, people who are tired of something the way it's done now and maybe the way it's done by some larger companies. And that's why acquisitions and buyouts happen along with because somebody's invented the next best mousetrap. And this is a way to do that success, much more successfully along the way. So if our listeners wanted to learn more about Nine High or get in touch, how could they do? Sure. First of all, you can definitely go to our website. So we're at www dot nine spell out the word n-i-n-e hyphen h-i for human intelligence.com we're also on linkedin that's where we put most of our stuff a little bit on facebook we've got to probably build out our social media a little bit more than we do even though i know that's very popular now you're helping us with that so i really appreciate it chad we do have some videos some short videos for demos so you know you find that on youtube also so you just click on them and it'll show you how the ai agents work it'll show you how a selection project works how we actually run through a development project And it's a quick seven minute video and it gives you a real quick highlight of how it all comes together and uh, just come in and start using it. If you feel creative, if you feel feel like you've got some things that you can offer, even if it's not your job now, do this on your own time. I highly recommend it. It can start off as a hobby and just a bunch of people coming together and you don't want people all the same type. Maybe want somebody who understands business a little bit more, somebody who understands certain technology a little bit more. Or maybe you're just good at conceptualizing, coming up with an idea, and then you want to invite some engineers in to help you with, with all the tough calculations or something. You know, a concept is a concept. You don't have to be the best engineer in the world to build things. You know, you can build a software platform. I built this whole software platform. I didn't write any code. I've got a team of people to build that for me. I needed somebody with the inspiration and the ideas. And that's, it could be just that. Somebody who wants to make a change. You're tired of the way it's done now, and they want to push the envelope and make it better. And uh, went to Nine High for a very low cost. And um, it's unlimited usage. Brainstorm as much as you want. Pull things together. And we can keep things private. There's privacy settings in there. If you want to make it public so that you can broadcast things out and maybe get some notoriety that way, you can do that also. The privacy is selectable. You can go either way with projects and topics that we have in there. Yeah. And that's, so the website and finding us on social media and the website, we have demos in there and, uh, or just call me, contact me. I'm happy to help. We're a startup, so we're hungry. We want business partners. We want people who can get this out to other companies, large companies and small companies. We can do revenue shares with people. If you're going to help us grow our business, we're going we're gonna to share that revenue with you. Get interested. There's so many technologies for space exploration. There's so many technologies for, for energy, for the environment. Everybody is a subject matter expert. It's just a matter of tapping into it. And the more we connect with each other, the faster we're going to get these things done. Well, thank you, Dave, for coming on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.